I'm not an atheist anymore because I don't look at the world that way anymore. I'm not a materialist anymore. I don't think the world's made out of matter. I think it's made out of what matters. It's made out of meaning. Look at it from, a, from the perspective of modern brain science. What we orient towards unconsciously, which means what captures our attention, is meaning and it captures our attention before we know what it is. The brain acts as if the world's made out of information or made out of meaning. Heidegger, for example, German philosopher, was convinced that the world was made out of meaning, essentially, and that um, people's primary interaction with being was interaction with meaning. And that isn't what modern people think because they're deeply materialistic. If you go back 400 years or 500 years and you look at what people meant when they said matter, which is what things are made out of, what they thought matter was isn't like what we think it is. It wasn't like this material stuff, sort of like dirt that everything was made out of. It was, it was much more complicated than that. The problem with the standard view of matter is that it doesn't really deal with the fact that matter comes in arrays and in patterns. And the patterns and the arrays, which is sort of lost when you think about atoms, that's where all the action is. That's where the reality is. And so I talked to him about that. He said, you heard of the internet? I said, yeah, Jim, I've heard of the internet. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And Jim said, the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another. And the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's, that's wrong because, well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong, mm -hmm. but, but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So, so now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. You say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you'd put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay, with the Bible at its base, which is certainly the case. Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, ling of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like literally, how do you understand that? The answer is, you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain, you build a low resolution representation of that in your, inside you, and then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. And the reason that I was speaking forcefully, let's say, or perhaps even somewhat angrily by the end was because not only was the free, the white noise generator. My name is David Lindauschu. I'm unwell. I need help. I need help. I just wanted to meet you. Right. I'm unwell. Right. I, call I hope that you up there. I, I want to be well find there. the help that you need. I want to know him better. Father, we thank you for David. Stop, stop pulling him. Father, we thank you for David. We thank you that he's the treasure in your heart, Lord. We pray for healing for him, salvation for him, restoration for him. God, right now, just come into his life and let him know that he's 
valuable to you. Lord, I pray that uh, in this moment that you would just begin to work in the Spirit. Lord, we let them know that we're for Him. We're not against Him. That God, um, that He just can find healing. Thanks that He's here. And you put it here in this moment. We pray this in your name. Let me, let me tell you something. I think what you just saw is where a lot of you are, but David's just honest enough to cry for help. I, I don't want us to alleviate what God's saying in this moment. And I'll be the first to tell you in front of our distinguished guests that these rules work, but all of them stop short without the ruler, without Christ in your life. And, and, and we are here for that. We're here for you. Lord, I, I thank you for Dr. Peterson. I thank you, Lord, for the people that he's been able to help. I thank you, God, for the principles um, in the book that have helped people just look up. And I pray that what they would see as they look up is um, more than answers to fix the problems, but more than ways to medicate the issues, but that, God, they would just look inside their soul and need wake up to the, to the fact that they need you. I thank you, Lord, that it's an initial bridge that hopefully points to the gospel. And I pray that for the people that are reading it, that that book would ultimately call people to your word, a lamp unto our feet. I thank you for the seeking heart, the humility, and the teachability of our friend. I pray that as he seeks you out, that, that he would begin to see you, Jesus, as more than just a hero, but a personal savior. Just do that in his soul, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you that we're here. Lord, we pray for David right now. We pray that he would know that, uh, that we're for him, we're with him. I pray in years to come that David will look back on this moment and see it as a crossroad moment where you just change the trajectory of his life. We love you, God. We, we learn from each other. And so thank you that we've learned so much from Dr. Peterson. We need this in your name. Amen. Amen. One more time. Can we thank our brother? It isn't easy to read a book like the Bible literally because it's full of, of literal contradictions. And it, whatever it is, especially the really archaic stories in in Genesis, whatever it is, it's not, it's not history the way we think of history. And so that's hard for people. It's hard for people to see how that might still be true. If it's not literal, how can it be true? And this is a discussion that I tried to have with Sam Harris a lot, because the atheist types, the rationalist types, there's something they miss. And what they miss is that fiction isn't false. It's not a lie. Right? It's not literal, but it's not a lie. And great fiction is true, but it never happened. So how can it be true? And the answer to that is something like, well, there are patterns in things, deep patterns, deep recurring patterns. You know, human nature, the fact that we're human, that, that the humanity itself is a recurring pattern. It has characteristic shape and great fiction describes the shape of that pattern. And the greatest of fiction, the greater fiction becomes, the more it is religious in nature. And that's not even a, a claim about the nature of truth. It's more a claim about the nature of experience. You know, when we say something is profound, what we mean is that it's moving and that it has a broad influence. It's capable of having a broad influence on the way we think and see and act. So if you read a profound book, like one of Dostoevsky's books, you could say of that book, and people often do, that it changed my life when I read that book. And a story that can change your life has a power that is best described as religious. And so religious is a kind of experience in some sense, rather in addition to a claim about what constitutes truth. And then those stories in Genesis, Cain and Abel, I think, and, and the story of Adam and Eve, because those stories are so deep that it's almost unfathomable. They get at the, at the most profound of patterns. And so to say that they're literally true 
is actually to massively underestimate how true they are. Because you could tell me what you did this morning. And that would be literally true, but like, who cares? Whereas if you read the story of Adam and Eve, it's so true that it applies to everyone always. And mere literal truth can't do that. And we don't have a good language as scientists, let's say, as psychologists, or even as citizens. We don't have a good language for that kind of truth. So the first thing about the Bible is that it's a comedy. And a comedy has a happy ending, right? So that's a strange thing because the Greek God stories were almost always tragic. Now, the Bible is a comedy. It has a happy ending. Everyone lives. There's a heaven. So now, what you think about that is a completely different issue. I'm just telling you the structure of the story. It's something like there was paradise at the beginning of time, and then some cataclysm occurred and people fell into history, and history is limitation and mortality and suffering and self-consciousness. But there's a mode of being, or potentially the establishment of a state, that will transcend that. And that's what time is aiming at. So that's the, that's the idea of the story. Now, it's a funny thing that the Bible has a story because it wasn't written as a book, right? It was assembled from a whole bunch of different books. And the fact that it got assembled into something resembling a story is quite remarkable. The question is then, well, what is that story about? And how did it come up as a story? And then I suppose as well, is there anything to it? It constitutes a dramatic record of self-realization or abstraction. We already mentioned that. It's like the, the idea, for example, of, of the formulation of the, let's say, the image of God is a, an abstraction. That's how we're going to handle it to begin with. I want to say, though, because I said I wasn't going to be any more reductionist than necessary, I know that the evidence for genuine religious experience is incontrovertible, but it's not explicable. And so I don't want to explain it away. I want to just leave it as a fact. And then I want to pull back from that and say, okay, well, we'll leave that as a fact and a mystery. And, but we'll look at this. We're going to look at this from a rational perspective and say that the initial formulation of the idea of God was an attempt to abstract out the ideal and to, and to consider it as a abstraction outside its instantiation. So, and that's good enough. That's amazing. That's an amazing thing if it's true, but I don't want to, Throw out the baby with the bathwater, let's say. It's a collection of books with multiple redactors and editors. So what does that mean? Many people wrote it. There's many different books, even, and they're interwoven together, especially in the first five books, by people who, well, I suspect, took the traditions of tribes that had been brought together under a single political organization and tried to make their accounts coherent. And so they took a little of this and they took a little of that and they took a little of this and they and they tried not to lose anything because it seemed valuable or it was certainly valuable to the people who had collected the stories they weren't gonna you know tolerate too much editing but they also wanted it to make sense to some degree so it wasn't completely logically contradictory and 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 completely absurd and so many people wrote it and many people edited and many people assembled it over a vast stretch of time and we have very few documents like that. And so just because we have a document like that is, is a sufficient reason to, to look at it as a remarkable phenomena and try to understand what it is that it's trying to communicate, let's say. And then I said, it's also the world's first hyperlinked text, which is, which is that again, and very much worth thinking about for quite a long time. There's four sources in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, four stories that we know came together. One was called the priestly, there's a source called the priestly, and it used the name Elohim or El Shaddai for God. And I believe El is the root word for Elah as well. And that's usually translated as God or the gods, because Elohim is, is utilized as plural in the beginning books of the, of, the, of the Bible. And it's newer than the Yahweh's version. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because Genesis 1, which is the first story, isn't as old as Genesis 2. Genesis 2 contains, the, the Yahwist version contains the story, for example, of Adam and Eve. And that's older than the very first book in the Bible. But they decided to put the newer version first. And, well, it isn't, and I think it's because it deals with more fundamental abstractions. It's something like that. It's like it deals with the most basic of abstractions, how the universe was created, and then segues into what the human environment is like. And so that seems to be the logic behind it. The Yahwist version 
uses the name YHWH, which apparently people didn't say, but we believe was pronounced something like Yahweh. It has a strongly anthropomorphic God, so one that takes human form. It begins with Genesis 2-4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when, and contains the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and the Tower of Babel and Exodus and Numbers, along with the priestly version. It also contains the law in the form, just the form of the Ten Commandments, which is like a truncated form of the, of the law. There's the Elohist source. It contains the stories of Abraham and Isaac. It's concerned with a heavenly hierarchy that includes angels. It talks about the departure from Egypt, and it presents the covenant code, which is this idea of that, you know, that society is predicated. This was Israeli society. It was predicated on a covenant with God, and that's laid out in a sequence of rules, some of which are the Ten Commandments, but many of which are much more extensive than that. And then the final one is the Deuteronomist code, and it contains the bulk of the law and the, what's called the Deuteronomic history. And it's independent of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And so we know that at least for, now there's debate about this, like there is about everything, you know, so I'm brushing over a very large area of scholarship, but people generally assume that there were multiple authors um, over multiple periods of time. And the way they've concluded that is by looking at textual analysis, you know, trying to see where there are chunks of the stories that have the same kind of style or the same reference. And people argue about that because, you know, obviously it's difficult to recreate something ancient, but that's, that's the basic idea. So it is an amalgam of viewpoints about these initial issues, and, and that's important to know. So it's like a collective, it's a collective story. If categories dis 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 dissolve, especially fundamental ones, the culture is dissolving because the culture is a structure of category. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Right. So, and in fact, culture is a culture is a structure of category that we all share. So we see th things the same way. Well, that's why we can talk. I mean, not exactly the same way because then we'd have nothing to talk about. But roughly speaking. We have a bedrock of agreement. Uh, that's the Bible, by the way. So I just walked through the Museum of the Bible in Washington. That was very cool. It's a very cool museum. So the structure, that's what the Bible Yeah, that's what provides. I figured out. I've been, I just figured this out this week. So it was a cool, it was a cool thing to walk through because it's, it's chronological. They have one floor, which is the history of the Bible. Mm. But it's not exactly that. It's really what it is, is the history of the book. Now, in many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally, because at one point there was only one book, like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there was one book. And for a while, literally, there was only one book. And that book was the Bible. And then before it was the Bible, it was, a, you know, it was scrolls and it was writings on papyrus. And, but it was, we were starting to aggregate written text together. And it went through all sorts of technological transformations and then it became books that everybody could buy, the book everybody could buy, and the first one of those was the Bible, and then it became all sorts of books that everybody could buy. But all those books, in some sense, emerged out of that underlying book. And that book itself, the Bible isn't a book, it's a library. It's a collection of books. And so, what I figured out was, partly because I was talking to my brother-in-law, Jim Keller, who's the world's greatest chip designer and has now designed a chip that's as powerful as the human brain, which is optimized for artificial intelligence learning, by the way. And so I talked to him about that. He said, you heard of the internet? I said, yeah, Jim, I've heard of the internet. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And Jim said, the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another. And the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's, that's wrong because, well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong, mm -hmm. but, but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So 
So now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. You say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you'd put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category, and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay, with the Bible at its base, which is certainly the case. Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, ling of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like, literally, how do you understand that? The answer is, you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain. You build a low-resolution representation of that in your, inside you. And then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. It's a whole different kind of true. And I think, this is, I think this is not only literally the case, factually, I think it can't be any other way. I probably spent my whole life trying to understand what evil was and, more importantly, what might be done about it. It's a strange pursuit in some ways for an academic to un undertake because academics tend to talk about academic things. And one thing you can say about evil is that whatever it is, it's not bloody well academic. Like, it, it's not an intellectual issue. It's an existential issue. And it's, it's not a theoretical issue. It's an, it's an issue that deals with the, the absolute nature of reality. And I guess sometimes I think that people who go into academia go into academia to shield themselves from having to ask questions about the absolute nature of reality. I think before you can talk about something, before you can dare to talk about something like evil, you should do some thinking about what it is that you're talking about, definitionally speaking. And I learned this, I believe, from a historian named Jeffrey Burton Russell, who wrote a very detailed history of the idea of the devil in the 1980s when such histories were, were strange, to say the least. He, he was very interested in the history, the embodiment of ideas of evil. And one of the things he, his work did for me was to help me clarify the distinction between two terrible things, the distinction, a distinction that has to be made, and that's the distinction between tragedy and evil. And I don't think you can talk about an evil at all until you distinguish it from tragedy. And so I'm going to try to distinguish evil from tragedy by making some reference to the essential existential condition of human beings. I would say that the nature of human being is such that it consists of a confrontation with the bounded finite, with the unbounded infinite. And that those are the bare facts of the matter. And the facts are that the, the, the world of experience as it presents itself to us is literally and not metaphorically complex beyond our capacity to understand. And that means that people deal in a real sense on an ongoing basis with the infinite. And I believe that that fact is the reason why religious experience is essentially, and belief is essentially endemic to mankind. It's a human universal and it's not because people believe, it's because human existence as such consists of a confrontation between the finite and the infinite. And religious systems merely take that into account. Now, our finitude in the face of the infinite has some inevitable consequences, and I would say those consequences are essentially the existential conditions of life. And the first of those consequences is, is that the finite is always overwhelmed by the infinite. It has to be, because it can't encapsulate it. And so what that mean, means is that, it's, that suffering is central to the nature of human existence. And suffering exists as a consequence of the consequences of our limitations. I mean, every single person who's alive is going to die. And every single person who's alive is going to deal with, with serious physical illness and mental distress. If they don't suffer, if they aren't suffering it directly, immediately, right now, on their own, 
It's almost inevitably the case that every single person who walks the earth is con confronting the, the bare bones of reality at that level in the guise of an afflicted family member. And so the fact of our finitude is, is again, no academic issue. It's, it's central to the nature of our being and we're forced to deal with it on an ongoing basis. So I would say insufficiency is built into human experience and, and there are existential consequences to that. Now I read something a long time ago and I don't remember who wrote it, but it was written about Jewish commentary on the Torah. Um, God is omniscient, omnipotent and omnipresent. What does he lack? An answer is limitation. And that's, that's, a, that's a riddle and an answer of unparalleled brilliance as far as I'm concerned because I think it speaks deeply to something about the central nature of existence itself and that is that without limitation there's no being. Now that's a hard thing to understand but I think you can understand it in a number of different ways. The first thing you might want to understand is that I play this game with my students sometimes in my class. I'll come up to a student, I'll pick them at poor victim at random and come up to them and say, okay, we're going to play a game. Say, and they say, okay, and I say, well, you move first. Well, and they don't know what to do. And the reason for that is because the limiting parameters of the game have not been defined. And as a consequence of that, they're stunned by their infinite freedom into complete immobility. And what that means in a sense is that the, in the absence of serious constraint, there can be no choice, no freedom, no existence. And, and I believe this to be fundamentally true, just as the fact that human being is vulnerable is fundamentally true. Here's another example that I think is more, it's more personal to me and it emerged in my imagination as a consequence of my contemplation of my son's vulnerability. So I have children, they are teenagers now, I still like them. Um, when my, one of the things I was really struck by when my children were little was how perfect they were. Like, and, and I believe that that was the um, benevolence of God in a sense. Children are tremendously difficult, they're a tremendous responsibility. But they're so perfect and they manifest that perfection in such a, 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 a remarkable way that that's the payment for taking on the responsibility of bringing them into, the be, into being and caring for them. And the thing about being a parent is that the vulnerability of people is made manifest to you in a way that was never the case prior to that. And, and it's, it's not, it's haunting and it's beautiful, but it's also exactly right in a way. And I was thinking, well, look at my son, he's a little kid. And, you know, you got to chase after him all the time. He can get sick. People hurt him. Uh, you know, people are going to be mean to him. He's going to be disappointed in his life. He's vulnerable. And, and it's, it's, it's a constant, tragic reality that he's vulnerable. And I thought, well, okay, let, let's say we want to do something about that. So let's say we make him so that no one can pick on him. So we could inflate him to about 20 feet high and equip him with a metallic skeleton and, and, a, and a cast iron exoskeleton. And you could equip him with a computerized intelligence that far supersedes his own and you could remove his vulnerabilities one by one hypothetically and of course more and more we're in a position where we could do that in reality and one of the things I realized right away was that as you remove the vulnerabilities you remove the thing you love and then I started to understand more deeply that vulnerability was a precondition for human being and that was a desirable precondition because the things about human existence that are wonderful and, and remarkable are so integrally tied up with vulnerability that they're actually inextricable. The Jewish commentary, what the infinite lacks is the finite, is a more abstract way of getting at the same thing. If you could do absolutely anything you wanted at any point and be anywhere you wanted and be anything you wanted and if, if there was nothing that was out of your reach, there would be nothing to do because you'd be everything at once and when you're everything at once, which is at least in principle the position of God, there's no story and there's no being and there's something about being that is a story and without limitation there's no story. So then the question starts to become with regards to consideration of human vulnerability. Is there a way to conduct your life in such a manner that the intrinsic vulnerability that characterizes your life is rendered not only acceptable but desirable? And to me, that's the central question of existence. And I tell you, get that wrong. You're on the wrong track. And if you're on the wrong track, man, you are in one terrible place. I would say with regards to tragedy, humans are vulnerable and that's tragic. But if tragedy is the price that we pay for existence, then so be it. If 
existence is justifiable. And so tragedy itself, which is merely a revelation of our vulnerability, can't be regarded as evil. It's just a, it's a condition of existence. And so it's necessary to distinguish the tragic conditions of existence from evil before you can even address the problem. And I think what that means to some degree is you should not blame on the relationship between the finite and the infinite the terrible failings of humanity that can be laid directly at the feet of human beings. So earthquakes aren't evil and cancer isn't evil and mental illness isn't evil and predators aren't evil. They're, they just are part of the way things are. But there are certain categories of human action that are definitely outside the parameters of mere tragedy and those are the things we really have to get a handle on. Evil for me is differentiated from tragedy by its lack of necessity and its voluntarism. And it's a tenet, I think, of modern materialistic thought that there are social or material causes for actions. And it's an extraordinarily useful theory. And I think, but I think one of the unfortunate consequences of that is that we've tended to write off much of human misbehavior and attribute it to, say, insufficiencies in material conditions, which is, is not an, it's not an acceptable theory. There are all sorts of human cultures that were characterized by virtually complete absence of material luxury well-being, whose cultures were highly functional and, and highly moral. And to describe the propensity towards misbehavior as a consequence of economic inequality is entirely beside the point as far as I'm concerned. Evil is more pernicious than that which is generated for example, by social inequality. I think it's actually, although this is a terrifying thought in some ways, it's more appropriate to consider it a form of uh, demonically warped aesthetic. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that, for example, because the, exa because the manifestation of this warped aesthetic, aesthetic makes itself apparent under certain conditions. So for example, I think it made itself apparent in the imagination of the first politician who, con who coined the acronym uh, MAD, or Mutual Assured Dis Destruction. That's an aesthetic of evil, to, to make a joke of a, a situation that catastrophic indicates the kind of malevolence that lurks behind the fact that such a condition exists. The motto on the gates of Auschwitz, I believe, in the Second World War, uh, Work will make you free. That's another manifestation of the aesthetic of evil. It's a terrible, terrible, ironic joke. And it, it, it's instructive to meditate on what sort of imagination would have the arrogance to tell such a terrible joke. The concentration camps are classic examples of evil. And I think by an analyzing at least certain kinds of events that occurred within them, it's easier to get a clear idea of what evil constitutes. And one, one of the stories that's always haunted me, I guess, is, I believe it's another story derived from Auschwitz. The prison guards in Auschwitz would take the prisoners who were already stripped of their dignity and to whatever degree possible, their identity and their culture and their language and their status of, as valuable beings. And yet that wasn't sufficient. They needed to be tortured in addition to that before they were killed. And the torture often consisted of uh, self-evidently counterproductive work, uh, uh, a situation that also frequently characterized activity in the Soviet Gulag Archipelago, where perhaps 60 million people met their death. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound and then back again. Now that's evil as far as I'm concerned, and, and you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective, in a sense, because it's a celebration of horror and it, it, it's, a, it's a conscious attempt to violate the, the conditions that make life itself tolerable. And it's aimed at dehumanization, destruction of the ideal, and at an even deeper level, revenge against the conditions of existence itself. I've tried to understand the developmental pathway that leads to acts like that. My academic research, as well as my clinical experience, has revealed to me that what appears to lie at the bottom of motivation for the excesses of behavior that characterize evil are two 
tightly causally related factors. One arrogance, another resentment. And both of those are tied up with vulnerability of human beings in the face of the infinite, but, but tied up with something more profound as well. The most thorough account of this that I've managed, I think, at least to partially comprehend, I believe is contained in the first couple of the stories in the Old Testament, in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve and the fall of man, and the immediately following story of Cain and Abel. As far as we can tell, those are very, very old stories. They predate Judaism, at least in some of their, in some of their structural elements. It's conceivable that some of the elements in those stories are as old as the human capacity to tell stories itself, assuming that they were grounded in an oral tradition that predated the written tradition. And we know that oral traditions can last, at least in some forms, unchanged for periods of up to 25,000 years. So the anthropological and archaeological evidence is fairly clear on that point. These are very, very, very old stories. And people remembered them and created them for reasons we really don't understand. And they're, they're strange and mysterious and unforgettable all at the same time. The story of Adam and Eve, as far as I can tell, is the story of the coming of consciousness, the coming of self-consciousness to mankind. And I think that the human, the, the human, human self-consciousness is what separates us from animals. In Genesis, there's an insistence that when Adam ate the apple that Eve offered to him, the scales fell from his eyes, and the first thing that he realized was that he was naked. And what that seems to me to mean is that, I mean, I think it means, first of all, that women make men self-conscious. And I think there's ample reason to presume that, and there's good evolutionary reasons for suggesting why that might be the case. Because sexual selection among human beings has been a primary force of evolutionary development, and sexual selection in human beings is primarily conducted by women. So, for example, as Roy has pointed out in his address to the APA a few years ago, and I hope I get this right, twice as many of your relatives were women as, as men. And that means that women are more frequently reproductively successful than men and that they reject most men. And the rejection of a man for reproductive purposes by a woman is the most serious form of rejection that's possible from an evolutionary point of view because the judgment is that, well, you might be nice enough to talk to, but you're sure not fit to have your genes propagate into the next generation. So it's no wonder that women can make, self make men self-conscious. And I think there's some reason to presume that it's the sexual selection forces that women placed upon men that drove rapid human cortical evolution and the development of self-consciousness. Now that's a leap, and there's no way I can justify that in the course of this particular uh, talk, but I think there is good reason to presume that it's the case. In Genesis, human beings become self-conscious, and the first thing that happens to them is that they realize they're naked, and then the next thing that happens to them is they develop the moral sense to tell the difference between good and evil. And it's a very strange thing, because in some sense, before a creature is self-conscious, there is no distinction between good and evil, because as I said before, a predator is not evil, it's just a predator. The fact of a predator, like a wolf, might be a tragedy for the rabbit, but you can't be assuming that the wolf is evil merely because it wants to eat the rabbit. But with the dawning of self-consciousness, there, there seems to be the emergence of a moral sense that's essentially unique to human beings. And that has something to do with our capacity to reflect upon the mechanisms of our action and then for some reason to be able to modify those actions and to choose which ones to implement into the future. In the future, we don't understand that. And you can even deny, if you'd like, that the, the phenomena of free choice exists, but our culture is essentially predicated on the notion that it does exist. And in the absence of evidence that it doesn't, I'm going to take the easy way out and assume that it does. Otherwise, things fall apart and they fall apart badly. When, after Adam and Eve become self-conscious, the first thing they do is clothe themselves. And to me, that's a mythological description of the emergence of culture as an intercession between the, the fundamental vulnerability and nakedness of the human form and the depredations of nature. If you realize that you're vulnerable and, and, and prone to death, the first thing you're going to do is to start rearranging the manner in which you construe yourself so that you can protect yourself from such an unfortunate outcome. 
That's, I think, partly why God curses Adam with the necessity of work once he finds out, once God finds out that people have become self-conscious. Like if you know that what's that winter is lurking in the future, for example, you're going to work. And animals don't work. They're just motivated to do whatever they do. But humans work. And that means they subvert their day-to-day -day motivations, their immediate motivations for the purposes of future security. And there's a real cost to that. I mean, part of the cost is separation from the pure and unadulterated flow of animal life. And I believe that people suffer from that absence of flow continually. And, and, and the, the advantage they gain from it is that they can plan for the future, but the disadvantage is that they're calculating and cold and separated from their own instinctual resources. Eve, of course, is cursed by what's going to be terrible pain in childbirth. And that's related to the development of the immense skull size that characterizes human infants and their incredibly lengthy period of dependence, which is also associated with their immense brain. After Adam and Eve become self-conscious, they hide. And this is actually a comical part of Genesis. It's never really read as a comedy, but it is a comedy. Even the fall itself is a comedy. And so they're hiding away behind a bush. And God comes walking through the garden. And God, the infinite, is accustomed to walking with Adam with no interruption of the flow of information between them. But Adam isn't there. And God says, you know, where, where have you gone? And Adam says, oh, well, I'm, I'm hiding. And God says, which is kind of stupid, really. And, and this is why it's a comedy. It's like he's hiding behind a bush. And this is God. And he can see through bushes. And like Adam should know that. But it doesn't really matter. He's hiding behind this bush anyways. And, and God, so Adam says, I'm hiding. And, and God says, well, why are, well, you know, what, why are you hiding? Well, it's because Adam is ashamed. Eh? And Adam says, well, I'm naked. And this is an example of the tremendous compression of human wisdom into a few lines that characterizes mythology. You say, well, why would people hide from God once they realize they're naked? And I would say, well, that's pretty obvious. Like, once you know you're vulnerable. Or do you really have enough courage to manifest any sort of semblance of a divine destiny? Well, the answer to that is pretty much clearly no, and it's no bloody wonder. And so the hiding is, people hide when they're self-conscious and vulnerable. And what do they hide from? They, they hide from their deepest destiny, and it's no wonder. God says, okay, yeah, well, you figured that out, how that happened. And Adam says, and this is comical too, well, it's the woman's fault, which I think is really funny, and which actually may have been the original sin and not the eating of the apple, right? The first time that the man blamed the woman for his self-conscious misery, I think that's the real fall and not the rise of self-consciousness itself. Anyways, we know the rest of the story. God says, oh, well, the cat's out of the bag now, you know. You know you're vulnerable and from here on in history starts. You're out of paradise. You're out of unconscious identification with the natural world. You're going to work. You're going to sweat lots of the time. It isn't going to work. And women, they're going to be beholden to their husbands, not because that's divine fiat, but because the developmental the developmental dependency of a human infant is so extreme that women are cursed to rely on men for protection when they're at their most vulnerable. Fine. So that's self-consciousness and an explanation for why people would hide away from their destiny. But then the next story, the Cain and Abel story, really elaborates that out and describes it. And so Cain and Abel, of course, are two sons of Adam and Eve, and they're really the first people because of course, Adam and Eve were made by God, so they're really not people at all because people are born. And Cain and Abel are the first two people. And they characterize, as far as I can tell, two canonical patterns of reaction to the terrible vulnerability that's revealed as a consequence of the development of self-consciousness. Cain and Abel make sacrifices to God. Why? Human cultures make sacrifices. That's what they do. Sacrifice, sacrificial ritual is a human universal. Blood sacrifice is a human universal. Human sacrifice, at least in some anthropological epochs, was regarded as a human universal. Why do people make sacrifices to God to please Him? It seems like a mystery to modern people. I ask my students, what sacrifices did you make to go to university? Well, they can answer that in two tenths of a second. 
You know, they can't party as much as they might have. They, they can't drink nearly as much beer as they might have liked to. More seriously, a lot of them work. A lot of them have put their families in, in, in serious financial straits to send them to university. They've given up all sorts of things in order to pursue, pursue a course of action that they believe will best ensure their harmonious relationship with the nature of reality. Everyone makes sacrifices. Okay, we can say that now because we're psychologically sophisticated and linguistically sophisticated. We know something about human psychology. But thousands and thousands of years ago, before people had this explicit psychological acumen, the best they could do is act out and tell stories about human psychology because they hadn't developed any further than that. And Cain and Abel is one of those stories. The sacrifices are burnt on an altar. Why? Well, the smoke rises. Well, so what? Well, God's up in the sky, and if the smoke rises up there and he gets a whiff of it, he can tell what the quality of the sacrifice was. And you can laugh about that, and you can think you can think about it as primitive, but it's not primitive. It's artistic, and it's beautiful, and it's, and it's accurate. And here's why. It's because before the invention of the electrical light, and maybe before the invention of fire, and the closest a human being could ever get to direct confrontation with the absolute unknown was to look up at the night sky. Because the night sky, especially when it's sprinkled with stars, confronts you directly with the fact of the infinite. And to make the presupposition that God resides in the infinite, and, and you're having a direct experience of the infinite at that moment, is not a primitive notion. It's a, it's a very intelligent and, and, and creative hypothesis. And so the notion that God occupies the sky, the day sky, being equally as impressive as the night sky, is not a primitive hypothesis. It's a reflection of the nature of a certain kind of human experience. So there's this idea in Cain and Abel that you have to make sacrifices in order to stay on the good side of God. And so I thought about that um, practically, say, not so much metaphysically, but practically, and realized that that was equivalent to the discovery of time, of the future. Because we do, we do act, and, it, and this is a peculiar discovery of human beings, and maybe a consequence of our expanded intelligence, is that we're actually aware of the future. And we actually treat the future as if it's something that you can bargain with. Now, partly it's because the future is other people and they remember your reputation. They remember your past actions. And if you do someone a favor, then that favor is in some sense stored up in the future. So you could think about the future as a place of judgment about your moral actions. And it's not that far from that to imagining a God who's keeping track of that or who even is that. But in any case, the idea of sacrifice emerges in the story of Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel both make sacrifices to God in, in order to stay on his good side, let's say. And what a sacrifice means is that you give up something of value in the present so that you can be, so that you can improve the future. And, you know, that's no different from what we call discipline. It's exactly the same thing. It's just the, the concretely acted out version of that. And so, you know, the idea basically was that well, God was in the transcendent heavens. And, and the first question would be, well, why is that? And it's like, well, if you go out on a really dark night and look up at the sky, you have a sense of what's beyond you, what, what's transcendent, what's infinite. And, and so to associate that with the highest of values is a reasonable association, right, from, from a, say, from an emotional point of view. So it's not particularly primitive. It's a smart um, metaphor or... It's a smart intuition, that, 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 and it's above you. And, you know, we tend to think of when you're moving towards an ideal, that you're moving up, that you're moving above, you're moving to the mountaintop, right? You're, you're going up, not down. And so it all sits within that same framework. And it's partly because when you go up, like on a mountain, you can see for long distances, right? So those, all those things are tangled together. So the idea is that you have to give up something of value now so, you, so that you make the future better. And... Sometimes it's even something you love now, and, and that, that's a good example too, because often the things that stop us from moving forward are our attachments to things that we should no longer be attached to, right? And in fact, you can almost make that definitional. If you're not moving forward in your life, there's a high probability that you have some idea or some mode of action or some habit that you're so in love with that you won't let go of it. So. All right, so Cain and, Abel, Cain and Abel make sacrifices, and there's kind of a hint in the story that it's just a hint that Cain's sacrifices are sort of second rate. But in any case, it's ambivalent, hey? But 
Abel, he just does wonderfully well and everything works out for him. And everyone knows people like that, you know. And so God accepts his sacrifices, but for some reason he rejects Cain's. And maybe it's the arbitrariness of God, or maybe it's because Cain's heart isn't in the right place when he's making his sacrifices, which is more likely. And so Cain goes and has a chat with God, and he says, basically what he says is something like, how in the world can you possibly justify this universe that you created? You look at me and I'm breaking myself in half, trying to adapt and to make things right, and it's not working. And then there's this able character, and things come easy to him, and everything is flourishing for him, and so, like, what the hell? If you don't understand that question, then you're not thinking, because it's very, very frequently the case when a serious catastrophe besets you in life, that you essentially ask exactly that question. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of the world? How come there's suffering? And it's easy to become resentful and vengeful as a consequence of that. And so you got to think about what state of mind having your sacrifices rejected puts you in, especially when you see someone who's successful, because that's where the jealousy and, and resentment starts to, starts to, what, fester is probably the right word. And so God says to Cain exactly what he doesn't want to hear, which is, well, yeah, okay, but you have made lots of mistakes in your life. So he basically says sin is at your door like a predatory and sexually aroused animal, and you've invited it into your house to have its way with you and produce something creative as a consequence. So he's used a sexual metaphor, you know, and so that you've willingly gone down the negative path. And you've allowed that to enter into you and, and to operate in a creative manner. And you've spun off all these terrible thoughts and, and this justification for not acting properly. And that's why things aren't going well for you. And so don't lay that at my feet, which is the most brutal possible message he could have got. And so then he leaves the presence of God, let's say. And it says in the story that his countenance fell, which meant he was basically enraged. And so what does he do? He goes out and kills Abel. And then that's, that's a very fascinating idea because Abel is his ideal, so he kills his ideal. And when you kill your ideal, you're lost. Sacrifice. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. That's all. You don't get to not make one. You're sacrificial whether you want to be or not. This is the Peter Pan story, roughly speaking. Is Peter Pan is this magical boy. Pan means, Pan is the god of everything, roughly speaking, right? And so it's not an accident that he has the name Pan. And he's the boy that won't grow up. And he's magical. Well, that's because children are magical. They can be anything. They're nothing but potential. And Peter Pan doesn't want to give that up. Why? Well, he's got some adults around him, but the main adult is Captain Hook. Well, who the hell wants to grow up to be Captain Hook? First of all, you've got a hook. Second, you're a tyrant. And third, you're chased by the dragon of chaos with a clock in its stomach, right? The crocodile. It's already got a piece of you. Well, that's what happens when you get older. Time has already got a piece of you. And eventually, it's got a taste for you. And eventually, it's going to eat you. And so Hook is so traumatized by that that he can't help but be a tyrant. And then Peter Pan looks at traumatized Hook and says, well, no, I'm not sacrificing my childhood for that. So that's fine, except he ends up king of the Lost Boys. In Neverland, well, Neverland doesn't exist, and who the hell wants to be king of the Lost Boys? And he also sacrifices the possibility that he'll have a real relationship with a woman, because that's Wendy, right? And she's kind of conservative, middle-class, London-dwelling girl. She wants to grow up and have kids and have a life. She accepts her mortality. She accepts her maturity. Peter Pan has to content himself with Tinkerbell. She doesn't even exist. She's like, she's like the fairy of porn. She doesn't exist. She's the substitute for the real thing. And so, but the dichotomy that you're talking about is very tricky because there's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then that is not a happy day.
you see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture because people can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues. And then when it finally hits, it just wallops you because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's yeah, yeah, you're young. You know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice, because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it. And then there's something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential and it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking, and then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, right? You end up being a good employer. Not, not that plumbers, I'm not putting plumbers down. It's like more power to plumbers. They've saved more lives than doctors. So, hygiene, right? So, you know, if you're a really good plumber, well, then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's, you can, once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at, hell, at hand. And Jung talked about that. He thought that the proper part of the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. Very, very smart. Well, he was very, very smart. So that's very wise, very wise thing to know. Sacrifice. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. That's all. You don't get to not make one.